Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here at the Best Practice Certification Training Academy and, for, and thanks for joining us for today's uh, webinar on transitioning. We're talking today specifically about ISO 9001 2015 and ISO 14001 2015 transitioning. So there is a component of this webinar that has been pre-recorded to prevent technical difficulties. So some of today's webinar is, has been pre-recorded um, and the live Q&A at the end will of, of course be live, so get your questions ready um, and I'll give you a shout out um, to ask for those questions. So we're just going to wait for one more minute while our live viewers come online. So just stay with us and uh, we'll wait for a couple more viewers. So um, a couple of housekeeping things while you're waiting um, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes is um, this stream is able to be paused. So you can watch it in two places. You can obviously click the button below where it says watch live on YouTube or watch on YouTube if you're in the training academy. If you're already over in YouTube, please comment below. So we've got June and Beck out watching the webinar live. We've got Jack here in the studio looking after the control panel and thank you to all those uh, great people here at the Best Practice Training Kid Academy for supporting me. Uh, but if you have any technical issues with your stream, if it pauses, if it freezes, uh, just press pause and uh, it's all, um, uh, YouTube is doing us a favour by pre-recording it and um, so it won't be lost, so your time won't be wasted. If you need to take a call, <clears throat> if you need to do anything, please go right on ahead and, um, and you can do that. So um, you can press pause, you can come back to it um, and uh, of course, like all of our webinars, we'll email you the recording. So thanks for joining us um, and we've got that recording coming through to you uh, after we've done the buffering and the editing at the end of the webinar. So it'll take about an hour. Uh, two hours, we'll send you out the recording after the webinar. So get your questions ready. If there's any specific questions that you want me to answer, uh, I'll stay around after the webinar uh, on Facebook and answer any questions via Facebook Messenger. So you can go to the Best Practice Certification Facebook page uh, and June and Beck will be monitoring the comments on the YouTube channel and, uh, and we'll cover that all for you. So uh, that's quite exciting. So um, um, yeah, we'll get into it. So how are we going, Jack? You ready to go? Perfect. Okay. So. June and Beck, you guys are ready. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, so my name's Kobe Simmet. I'm the CEO here at Best Practice. Uh, yes, I've got a young, fresh face. For, so for those of you that um, haven't met me before or haven't seen any of our webinars, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, the team here at Best Practice is a young team. We're, we're um, very dynamic and, and inspirational. And, and I think um, what's really important to communicate is while we've all got young, fresh faces, we've gotten straight into this as part of our process and part of our careers. Uh, because we're very passionate and our, our ultimate purpose here at Best Practice is to create or inspire customer confidence. And how we go about doing that is we're looking to create fun, efficient, profitable, safe, environmentally friendly and sustainable companies that are going to be around for the future. And you know, they're fun to work at, really exciting. So that's our passion. We're really passionate about business. We're really passionate about business improvement. That's why we exist. So everything that we do here at Best Practice uh, is quite exciting. Um, the team are on board and we love absolutely doing what we're doing and that's what best practice is all about. Um, we have a lot of fun every day trying to figure out all the different ways that we can improve businesses and help businesses. We do it online, we do it face to face, we've got our training academy, we've got our YouTube channel, uh, we've got a Facebook page and we've got lots of people running around doing on-site assessments with companies as well. So um, it's really, really exciting. Um, sometimes we get it right um, and that's really, really exciting. Sometimes we get it wrong and we use that as an opportunity for improvement. And that's what we like to uh, inspire you guys out there in the community to help us with is, you know, you help us with things like these webinars by watching it, gives us feedback on what's working, what, uh, what works and what we can do to improve and also what's not working. So um, we're always welcome to suggestions. Uh, we love you guys, you guys are part of our family, you're part of a great family of businesses that are really inspired to improve and really inspired to improve your customers experience. So in quality systems, you guys inspiring your customers. In safety, you guys inspiring your staff, your staff to be safe and your contractors and, and stakeholders to be safe. And then obviously from an environmental management pe perspective, inspiring um, your company to be a good corporate citizen. And then we have other systems like food safety and data security and lots of disability systems. But it's all about business improvement. It's what we're ultimately very, very passionate about. And it's why I get out of bed every morning. That's why I'm excited and why we put the effort into things like our webinar today. So my name's Kobe. Thanks for joining me. If you haven't uh, spent any time with our webinars, welcome to the family. Uh, and if you have seen some of our webinars or you're a participant with us here at Best Practice, 
welcome back and thanks for being on board. Uh, we do love everybody that participates with Best Practice and um, thanks for being part of our tribe. Um, okay, just a little bit about uh, a little bit about more of some of the intricate details of best practice. Um, as you can see behind me, above my head, um, we do have a formal system where we acknowledge the great work that you do to build a management system, uh, whether it's a quality system, a safety system, or an environment system. So if you just look here, just behind me, uh, up here we've got our logos, um, and so there's the different logos for the different programs that we have, and that's you know those certificates come after we've been on site and worked with a client to give them you know, some analysis around their management system and, and we see that all of the right parts are in place. Um, for those of you that don't spend time or engage us to spend time with you on site, we've got all these other great stuff that's happening over here um, and that's for you to engage with us um, maybe on a one-to-one -one basis. So maybe your company's not engaging with us but you want to engage with us and you love being part of our family. So there's lots of stuff happening on LinkedIn. Um, we've got lots more planned for LinkedIn, so following the company LinkedIn page, so the best practice certification LinkedIn page. We've got great stuff happening, lots of great articles, lots of great things coming along. Uh, lots of stuff happening on Facebook, lo a little bit of stuff happening on Twitter. Um, just personally, uh, I'm still trying to figure out Twitter and how, how it works and how we can support you using Twitter. Uh, so I'd love some advice. If you've had some great experiences with Twitter and you can give us some guidance on how we can use it to help you, um, and how we because we've got the resources here to do it and, and if you like Twitter then maybe um, if you've got time I'd love to hear your thoughts um, so send me a message or or tweet me and um, and help me because we, we want to help you and we want to learn um, so if you're better at Twitter than us um, we'd love some guidance and some coaching but we're doing little bits and pieces sharing articles uh, retweeting and reposting so hopefully we're adding some value for you um, lots of stuff happening on Instagram uh, best practice TV has an Instagram page uh, June is always thinking about great creative quotes to keep inspiring you to keep improving. So uh, lots of fun on, on um, Instagram. It's a good way to message us here at Best Practice, sending us a DM on Instagram. Uh, great way to get instant engagement with us backwards and forwards. So if you want to say hi, shout out, uh, send us a joke, um, like our posts um, and, and equally share it so, um, so we get more followers on Instagram to help more people. Very passionate about helping companies and the more companies we can help around the world, that would be absolutely fantastic. Now, YouTube, if you haven't seen our YouTube videos, um, then I'd encourage you to pop across onto YouTube, search for the Best Practice Certification or Best Practice TV YouTube channel. There's now over 250 videos on the YouTube channel. Uh, some of them are obviously not publicly listed and we can get them to you via links, um, but there's, I think there's now, Jack, about 200 public videos. Um, so. YouTube's an absolutely fantastic resource. We talk lots and lots and lots about what's going on here in business. Uh, lots of short little tips and tricks. Uh, we do two to three videos a week on YouTube. Um, and obviously this, we're using YouTube as, uh, as the engine room, uh, the software behind this webinar to bring this live broadcast to you today. Now, it's a great way for people to learn. It's not everyone's learning style. Some adults and, and uh, learners like to read. Um, and, and equally a lot of people pick up things from watching. It's a great way to stay in touch with us. So, you know, two to three minutes of your week or two to three minutes every couple of days just to pick up some tips and tricks on improving your business via our YouTube channel. It's free. Um, YouTube's a fantastic resource. So there's a great facility on YouTube where you can click subscribe and you can subscribe to the channel and then our notifications when we post new videos will come directly to you. You need a Gmail account or a, a Google account for that. So, and again, that's free. So I think it's important to sign up for a free Gmail address if you haven't got one. Use that as your personal email address. Uh, it's a really great way to engage with us using your Gmail account. Um, you know, we love and recommend, highly recommend the, the Google products. And obviously uh, YouTube is a Google product um, and it ties nicely with your Gmail account. So get your free Gmail email address, um, jump across onto YouTube, hit subscribe, and you'll get all of our great tips and tricks and videos and you can share them and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you're not a Gmail user or a Google user, no problems. You can still go to YouTube and, and, and see those videos, but they are fantastic. And it's part of my passion. It's part of our process to help you guys uh, improve your businesses. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the last little image there is obviously Snapchat. Uh, if you're a Snapchat user, we're starting to do a little bit of stuff on Snapchat. So finding best practice TV on Snapchat. And Beck looks after Snapchat and does little snaps and bits and pieces from time to time. Um, not a lot of followers in that space right now. Um, we're, we're growing that, that component and trying to figure out how we can use Snapchat to help some of the younger generation uh, as they're thinking about business and employment and work and those sorts of things. 
um, and being positive and motivated and really engaged. So if you've got some younger users uh, in your business or part of your organization and they are Snapchat users, they may like to engage with us uh, over Snapchat and it's a great little, um, great little social media platform that we've been using. Now down the, sorry Jack, just go back for me. Now down the bottom of the page is my LinkedIn account. Um, so at Kobe Simmet, I'll just move out of the way. There it is there on LinkedIn. Um, and there's a hashtag keep improving every day that we use on LinkedIn. But uh, please find me on LinkedIn and send me a LinkedIn request. Now if you can't send a request, send me a message. Send, click the in mail button, send me a message and we'll connect on LinkedIn. Um, it is a great way to communicate directly with me. So if you've got questions, you don't want those questions to be in the public forum, you just want to ask me a question and get a response, uh, LinkedIn is a great way to engage with me. Uh, send me a LinkedIn uh, message, so you can either click follow and follow me on LinkedIn, or you can connect with me. I love being connected with uh, lots of people on LinkedIn. Now I check LinkedIn every evening, and I look at the messages and respond to the messages and respond to questions. Um, and I love engaging with people, and um, and it's a really great way. So if you've got a simple question, um, I'm happy to fire back a simple answer, and just know that you're there, um, and and help you as best I can. So I, I dedicate about an hour, hour and a half of every day to respond to people there, um, and it's a great little way to just connect backwards and forwards. So um, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn and you like LinkedIn, it's absolutely fantastic. So the best practice company page, lots of articles to help you, and then obviously my page as well. Okay, so enough about best practice. Um, in this session, we're talking about transitioning, and uh, it is important because we're getting to the really critical end of a transition period uh, where two new standards uh, ISO 9001 and 14001, so two new versions of those standards, were released in 2015. Now, it's now obviously getting towards um, the, well, we, we're coming in, we're about to start Q2 in the Australian financial year, so the, we're the, the second quarter of the Australian financial year, or that would be Q, Q3 uh, in the US financial year. Um, now, when we come into 2018, the beginning of 2018, we've got a very important deadline. So. Uh, we were given, or organisations that had certification to the previous versions of these standards, were given three years to transition. And so they were released in 2015 in September, and then the deadline is September 2018. Now, there's an important part of that. There's an interpretation out there in the marketplace that that transition needs to happen by March. So a couple of people with varying opinions. Now, the drop-dead time for your transition is exactly three years from when the standard was released. So that's September 2015, which means the drop dead uh, time is 2000, September 2018. Now, if you've got a previous certification or a certificate or a previous management system uh, that follows a previous version of ISO 9001 and 14001 that is certified, so if you've got a management system and it's not certified, you don't have to change anything. So. Um, a lot of people have been getting very stressed about this transition and what the changes are. So if you're not certified and you're not externally audited, you've just got a management system in place, there's nothing wrong with the previous versions of these standards. What's happened is the ISO community and specifically the two committees that look after these standards have seen an opportunity to improve them. And change is a constant and improvement is a constant and we grow and we learn and we develop every day and organisations grow and learn and develop every day. So I think it's important to adopt the principles of the new standards, but I'm not saying that you have to. Now, one disclaimer here, if you are certified, when we get to March 2018, as an organisation that certifies companies and gives you a certificate, we can no longer give you a certificate after March next year to an old version of the standard. In fact, here at Best Practice, we stopped issuing certificates to old standards, new certificates to old versions of the standards about 18 months ago. So for 18 months we've, we've only been issuing certificates for new clients and new certifications to the new version of the standard. So when you get to March 2018 it's important to consider A, do you want to retain your certification and we've, we've had in the last month, uh, it's not the last month, it's probably about the last three months, 11 companies that I'm personally aware of here at Best Practice that have elected to no longer be certified and that's okay, I would encourage that. I think it's important when you're considering your business plan and your business going forward that you do think logically, systematically, and more importantly using numbers about your business going forward. And I would congratulate, and I do congratulate those 11 companies for withdrawing their certification. 
there's having the external costs as part of certification and the external efforts involved in certification being removed for their bit from their business has settled down and reduced some of the burden and I think that's important and, and congratulations to those 11 companies for you know biting the bullet and withdrawing their certification we will still support them if they want to be supported with that we've still got free YouTube videos we've still got these free webinars there are still training courses that they can do so if your organization is one that's considering whether you're going to stay certified or not um, have a real good think about it and if you need to withdraw your certification and not move to the new standards then that's absolutely fine but please and I'll go through the rest of this webinar please keep developing and maintaining a business plan please keep thinking about your strategy um, what is your strategy for the business what is the future of the business how are you going to grow the business maintain the business you know think about sustainability think about profitability think about your customer experience uh, think about safety and environment those are all important things if you're closing the door on the business then that's fine but but I really do think it's important to stop once a year and really think strategically about the organization I can talk more about that later in this presentation um, and think about what's relevant so for those of you that are going to continue on with certification because a customer requires it or a contract or a set of regulations require it let's talk about how we make it really simple and easy to do this transition if you haven't done so already if you have done the transition already let's talk about how you can minimize the effort in managing your systems into the future and that's what we hear about so remembering at best practice we exist to create fun companies that are profitable efficient environmentally friendly safe fun to work at um, so we're going to talk about how we minimize that effort so that going to work is exciting and improving businesses and seeing the results of growth um, is something that you can celebrate so um, thanks Jack let's move on okay so one of the things that I've observed across a whole bunch of organizations uh, that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis on a personal basis is that you know there's an expectation that we'll communicate everything that's in the standard and people get a little bit scared and nervous about the standard and anxious about the standard now the reality is it's a very very small document it's it's only about 50 pages um, and it, you know the actual part of the standard that requires you to do things and set up the structure is 15 or 16 pages there's not a lot there and if you boil it right down it's only about 10 pages of content that you need to go through sorry that's 9001 that I'm talking about uh, 14001 it's a little bit bigger not too much a little bit more stuff but not too much it's not an overwhelming document now I'm you know at the position that I'm that I'm at in my career I can honestly say that I've read ISO 9001 in its different versions probably on average over the last 15 years about once every three months now there's been points in my life where I've been reading rereading the document monthly as a working document and I've you know there's there's you know I've printed it off and I've scribbled notes on it and I've printed it off again and I've highlighted it and I've printed it off again and I've you know ripped it apart and I've you know pages so so I have a electronic electronic copy of it and there's a screenshot of it right there uh, that you can see behind me and and everybody here at best practice uses that as a working document so don't be scared to you know to print a working copy of this document and scribble notes on it and use it as your friend use it as your go-to reference like your cookbook if you like um, in terms of improving your organization using the tools and techniques that are described in the standard to keep improving the business and keep going through those cycles of improvement now where can you get a copy of the standard if you don't have it iso.org is the peak body globally that produces the standards depending on where you are in the world you may be able to buy a soft copy or hard copy version of that standard from your local standards provider but what I know that you can do is you can go to iso.org and you can get from the source the information now sometimes the local standards bodies do start to sort of tangle the information um, they might have a commercial reason you know they might they might sell the standards and they might sell other services and so getting really clear information about what's going on is difficult so I always recommend go straight to the top and that's ISO and um, and that's where we draw a lot of our information down from um, and, and make it user-friendly to help you guys so um, cut out the middleman go straight to the top and um, and support um, the international organization of standardization by buying your documents from them directly now when we actually get into the standard and we've got 9001 and we've got 14001 I'm going to say this read the standard now if you don't understand it that's why you can contact me on LinkedIn if you've got questions about it what does it mean what does the clause mean how to apply it 
how do you do it? Um, I'm happy to help you with those questions. I do that for free. Um, you know, I get lots of questions. I try to get sort of 20 or 30 answered every night. Um, so it is something that you can, you know, you can reach out to me and, you know, obviously you can reach out to us here at Best Practice. Um, we do have formal training courses, so you can log on to the bestpracticecertification.com.au website uh, and there's a blue button at the top which takes you through to our training academy and our shop, our online shop. All of our courses are online. You do them in this environment. They're exactly the same as our webinars. The background's a little bit different, but they're videos. There's some reading material and I'll help you through. There's some free checklists and free booklets. But there's nothing like going to the standard and reading it and interpreting it and understanding it and getting insights yourself. And my recommendation from my personal experience is to just go over it, you know, sort of frequently. And when I say frequently, it could be every second month or every third month. You know, just pulling it out and, you know, making yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a glass of water and just having a skim through it and maybe making some notes and, and you'll get different insights every time you get back to it. So a um, little bit of wording there, shall, should and could. Shall is a mandatory requirement. So if you choose to comply with the standard, it is important to implement and execute on all of the shalls. Now shoulds and coulds, they're recommendations, they're good ideas, they're good things to do, but they're not mandatory. So look out for the shalls. Uh, and sometimes it's a good idea to go through a printed copy of the standard and highlight the word shall. And that'll start to create a bit of a checklist that you can use to check off that you've met all of the requirements. Now, when we talk about ISO 9001, let's, let's importantly just acknowledge that it's a framework or 14001, they're both frameworks. So they're both guidelines for setting up a system to implement your business plan. Now I'm gonna go through that for the rest of the webinar and I'm gonna use the business plan as the context. Now these standards, uh, require or intend that you take from top senior leadership your management system all the way down through the organization now the best way to describe that is if if your organization your organization should and it's it's best practice to have a business plan to be thinking two to three years ahead with the business a five-year business plan is probably not as relevant now as it used to be uh, two to three year business plan ensures that the business is thinking strategically about the short term short term things it needs to do to survive with a long-term view uh, in place. And so these standards sit below your business plan. Now, if you don't have a business plan and the business is not clear on its direction, then forget about the standards. Think about what your strategy is, your goals, your objectives, your go-to-market, your market research to, to ensure you're sustainable. Then use the standard and the context of the standard to deliver. So we do see lots of organizations that try to build management systems in the absence of a business plan. And then a business plan gets built and the two things are disconnected and often the quality manager, environment manager, safety manager, systems representative is removed from the core strategy and core strategic direction of the business. So that's a structural problem. Um, if you find that that's your situation and, and what I'm saying sounds familiar, then uh, have a think about having that conversation. Now, there becomes this structural issue where the business says, can you just get on and build this management system? But these standards, when used properly, sit right dovetailed or connected in with the, the bottom of, uh, of a business plan. Thanks Jack, let's move on. So if we're gonna get into this process, I'm gonna talk about what we need to do to transition. Now with an existing quality system or an existing environmental management system that already meets the requirements of the standards, there's not a lot that needs to be done. However, um, showing evidence of some change is important. Now uh, a good quality business plan that's, that's uh, adjusted and updated on an annual basis will have something that is either like or similar to a SWOT analysis. So looking at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Now first and foremost, the quality system, we'll look at it from a customer's lens. So we're looking through the lens from a customer's experience perspective. And when I'm involved in that process, either assessing that process or participating in that process, I place myself in the shoes or the role of a customer and I think about if I was a customer of your organization or as a customer of this organization looking around saying what would my experience be what would my expectations be what would I like and not like and if you have three or four people from the executive team participating from that perspective you will start to get a really good sense of how the organization can look for some opportunities for improvement, identify those opportunities for improvement, and then start building out plans to execute on those improvements and implement them so the customer experience improves. Now from an environmental perspective, 
the same applies, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So some of the environmental opportunities to be a good corporate citizen, some of the weaknesses and threats with uh, environmental regulation and increasing environmental awareness in the broader public community. Now the same applies here with a special note or a disclaimer. 14001 has a unique little requirement to do a stakeholders analysis. Now, while 14001 makes it pretty clear, I'd recommend doing that from a customer's quality perspective, a safety perspective, environment perspective. So as we look at strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats, it is important to be thinking about all of your stakeholders, your financial institutions, your customers, your regulators, government departments, international organisations, staff, subcontractors, employees, customers, end users, everybody that's in that sort of community network around your organisation and have those in mind. Now, a practical tip here would be to write a big list or a big mind map of them up on a whiteboard and then be sitting in a forum where you can identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, thinking about all those stakeholders. So really good tip there. Um, here at Best Practice, we use lots of butcher's paper. I'm here in the studio, there's butcher's paper on the wall, there's whiteboards outside. Uh, we do lots of this identification then we pull it down and put it into registers and spreadsheets. And I'm gonna talk about how to actually take the SWOT analysis and actually put that into your management system. So, quick summary before we move on is taking the business plan, building out a SWOT analysis or something similar that identifies you know, risks and strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. It's a great simple tool. I'd encourage you to adopt it. It's talked about in the ISO community, so um, have a think about how we do that. And as we move into the next slide, we'll talk about how we actually capture it. So environment and quality. This would be something that we would be looking for that's new. Uh, where we haven't previously asked for it. It's been expected that it's there, but uh, as we look at transitioning a customer, we would encourage you to be creating this piece of evidence, undertaking this process, and when we come out to do an assessment to transition you from the old version of the standard to the new, for quality and environment, we'd expect to see something similar to a SWOT analysis. Either a, we'd expect to see a SWOT analysis, but if you want to choose to do something different, show us something that has the same intent as a SWOT analysis, and let's look at what we can maybe, how we can maybe present that. Okay, so in this instance, we've just done a really quick, simple example. We would take the things we talk about and identify in a SWOT analysis. Now, one disclaimer here, it doesn't have to be perfect. Management systems are about continually improving, and, and we have that hashtag here at Best Practice on all our social media, which is hashtag keep improving every day. So it is important that we go through and say, okay, well, we've got a risk register, um, uh, we've done a SWOT analysis, we're gonna look to do that a little bit more frequently, sort of from time to time, and keep updating this register. So what's happened here is we've just used our, um, our little table. Uh, this has been a little screenshot of an Excel spreadsheet where we're starting to identify the issues right over on the side there in that column, which is the risk description, and then we're starting to give them a bit of a ranking and using a risk-based thinking approach. So the new standards, the, the, the next subtle change that's talked about in 14001 and 9001 is risk-based thinking. Now, lots of people getting really confused about that. How do we do that? We're you know, getting it all over complicated. This is micro detail, it's bureaucratic. No, that's not the case. Very simply, risk-based thinking is about prioritization. It's important to acknowledge that you can get overwhelmed when you write yourself a huge to-do list and the organization has a huge to-do list. And it is important and the standards do acknowledge that you can't get everything done. So the things that are really, really important that are gonna really upset your customers, the things that are really, really important that are really unsafe, the things that are really, really important that are really you know, environmentally damaging, they're the top risks, and we can start to use risk tools, guidance, tips and tricks with like a, you know, a, a consequence and likelihood and then risk ranking that's, that's here in this table. Um, you know, that, that's the sort of stuff that helps you to prioritize it, but what's important is that risk-based thinking is all about priorities, and risk-based thinking is about doing the big, chunky, ugly stuff first, but keeping an eye, half an eye, on the things that you have identified that are low risk just in case they start to escalate. And so monitoring this risk register, yes, that's still low risk, yes, it's still low risk. Oh, actually that one's just changed risk because something new has changed in the business, so it's gone from a low to a medium, or a medium to a high. So risk-based thinking is all about prioritization. It's all about acknowledging that you can't do everything all of the time. Organizations are limited with money and 
resources and capital expenditure. And so building out a risk register means that you can justify spending some money to fix things that are really important and not spending money to fix things that aren't important. And, and one of the great terms here in Australia that we use is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's not broken, don't fix it. But it is important to anticipate if it's going to break and that's what risk-based thinking is all about. Prioritisation, fix it if it's broken, fix it if it, if it might break and it's really critical, then, uh, then let's maintain it. So um, thanks Jack. So that, a risk register, good way to show us um, that you've been through a SWOT analysis. It's a good way to record evidence of that meeting. Importantly, doing a SWOT analysis regularly is important and the risk, maintaining and updating that risk register regularly. Now what's regularly? Um, this is my personal opinion, uh, I think quarterly. So I think um, a, a, a SWOT analysis that is a little bit more comprehensive on an annual basis and just a check-in and a, and a touch-up and a tweak and a maintenance of that SWOT analysis and risk register on a quarterly basis. Um, so let's talk about, with regards to transitioning, what's happened. With the new versions of the standards, they are encouraging us to connect our management systems more comprehensively and more succinctly with, you know, and I, and I talk about the, the joining these two things together with the business plan. And so what I've, in this slide here, what we've created is just a, a business plan improvement cycle or a business improvement cycle. And we've talked about where a management system sits, you know, down the bottom. So on the other side of the slide there, you can see management systems, but I'm gonna just talk us through each of these steps as we, as we um, you know, go around um, and, and, and down through that process. So let's start at the top, right at the very top of this slide with market research and planning. Now, a lot of the observations that we make here at Best Practice is organisations that say yes to a customer right at the very first uh, instance, and they say yes to a customer and they keep saying yes to customers and they evolve into an organisation that is, of course it's customer centric, but it's driven by what the customer wants. Now, Henry Ford is very famous for a saying, which was, if I gave the customers what they want, I would have given them a faster horse. Now, in fact, we're talking about obviously the Ford motor car and Henry Ford, you know, building the Model T Ford um, and producing them in his big factories and producing motor car and being, you know, obviously the, the instigator of the innovation of the motor car from horses to motor cars. But he's, he's, he's making a really important point where he says, if I gave them what they wanted, I would have given them a faster horse because customers wanted a faster horse. But look how fast motor cars are now. Much, obviously, supercars are obviously much, much faster than horses. So what we're talking about with market research and analysis is yes, of course, on the short, short term, um, you know, we talk about the customer always being right, but, but that's because the customer's got the money or the customer's got the, you know, they're requiring the service, we provide the service to value add and the customer uh, has the money. Now, importantly, if we think about organizations like Apple, for example, um, 15 years ago, this mobile phone device that's an Apple iPhone just simply didn't exist. The smartphone just simply didn't exist. It was an idea, but it didn't exist. Now, I don't believe that there were a lot of people out there saying, I want, 15 years ago, I want Facebook on my iPhone, or I want apps, social media apps on my iPhone. I know that 20 years ago, my dad said to me, it would be really good if I had my phone book in my pocket, but my phone book's too big. So what we do now have is all of our contacts, our critical contacts that we can save them into our smartphone. So that was being asked for, but what wasn't being asked for is that we'd have this pocket computer. So market research and analysis is really important to be taking two perspectives. One is what are our customers asking for, but it's important that we drive our business and our organization in the direction for which it exists rather than what our customers are asking for and and then equally we do in the short term do what our cost you know meet our customers needs so maybe I could reframe what I'm saying and saying what are the future needs of your customer what are the future desires of your customer but what are the current needs and wants and desires of your customer and it's important to meet the current needs of your customers while thinking about future needs so that you can keep involving and innovating the business in its improvement cycle. So, I mean, I can go lots more into market research and setting up and structuring businesses, uh, but that's for maybe another conversation uh, down the track. 
What the standards, and we're talking about transitioning, are encouraging us to do is drop that market research and analysis and customer expectations, customer requirements, down into our business plan, from our business plan down into our SWOT, and we've talked about our SWOT uh, right here, we talked about it on the previous slide, so we're starting to analyze that. Then we set ourselves, what we're talking about right here is our long-term goals and objectives. These are the things we want to achieve. Now, the important thing about goals and objectives is there are things that we don't want to achieve or are not priorities. And if we want to identify those and put those aside and just keep monitoring them. So here at Best Practice, we run an issues list, an improvement register, which are the things we can't work on right now, but we monitor them. So they came up, yes, we should do that, but we can't afford to do it now. We don't have enough people, money, resources, time, effort, energy to do those things, but we're going to monitor them. So when we come back around to choosing what our goals and objectives are going to be, we revisit that list and see, still see if it's important. Then we look at assembling our personal resources and our, uh, over the other side there, our infrastructure to start to say that we're, we're starting to create and assemble the organisation. Now personal resources, you know, you can have your org chart, you can have your job descriptions, you can have your roles, you can have policies, procedures. That's how we start to organise people and give them instructions. And then resources, offices, factories, equipment, refrigeration, trucks, transport, ships, containers, uh, mines, um, internet, phone services, all those things that infrastructure-wise we need for our organisation for the people to do their work. Um, now, this is where we assemble personal resources and infrastructure, put that all together to create the management system. And the management system is there to give guidance and advice, and if you like, stepping stones across a pond. So setting up the stepping stones across the river or across the pond for your organisation to follow so they can stay on the right path when things get messy. So management systems are all about assembling the guidance and advice and structure so that we can keep the organisation running and it can become an autonomous operation. Now, once we've got obviously the resources, the infrastructure and the management system set up, my personal most favourite topic is the numbers and the dashboard. And my question to you is, do you have a clear picture of your organisation's performance? Have you got that clear picture and more importantly, is the data then giving you insights? And importantly, um, and someone said to me yesterday, don't give me data, give me insights. Now, the weakness we see across the bulk of the organizations that we work with is they don't have a clear picture of their organization's performance. They may say to us, we have a clear picture of our profit and our profit and loss statement and our cash flow statement and our balance sheet, but they don't have a clear picture of the lead indicators the lead metrics, the lead statistics that are driving that. For example, they can't predict if they're going to have a high potential incident, safety, customer related contract dispute or environmental issue that's going to affect their P&L and their balance sheet. So what we're talking about with a management system, a quality management system, a safety management system, environment management system, we're talking about preventing, potentially preventing, obviously, customer related issues, safety issues, environmental issues, but in the context of an organization that needs money to operate, we're using quality safety environment management systems to prevent the impact on the P&L, um, as well as of course injuries and incidents and, and, um, and quality issues. So it's important to understand that that's, you know, if, if you need the financial justification that the management systems are there to give you a good sustainable ability to predict your profit and loss and also your balance sheet performance. So I wanted to link those two things together today because that's the expectation of best practice in terms of transitioning. We want to see a clearer link of your management system to your business plan. Um, the major piece of evidence or artifact that needs to be developed is this risk-based thinking approach um, and clearer goals and objectives. And then over on the other side there of the slide, we're talking about numbers. We wanna see clearer dashboards, we wanna see clearer numbers and so we'll go into that in the next slide. We want to see that tied into management review um, and then obviously back into market research. So what we're talking about here is well how often should we do this? My advice to you is quarterly. I would like to see and my guidance and best practices in this context would be to management review, you know, numbers evaluation on a quarterly basis. Now that may already be a system in your organisation for your financial reporting and performance and I would encourage you to be integrating your quality performance, your quality numbers, your quality performance, your environmental performance, your safety performance, your data security performance, all into that quarterly reporting process. And then your management system is gonna to operate to support your organization. So quarterly management reviews, 
quarterly reporting on all of the metrics that are associated with your quality management system and your environment management system. And then that is the cycle of business planning and business improvement as it relates to management systems. Your management systems sit there to be the good quality management system to deliver your business plan. Thanks, Jack. Okay, numbers and insights. You know, and, and I talked about my colleague yesterday that said to me, don't give me data, give me insights. Now, if you haven't got the data, you can't get the insights. So my question again is, do you have a clear picture of your organization's performance? And something I've been saying now for 20 years is develop 50 performance over time graphs. Now, once you get to 40, you're gonna to struggle to do the final 10. That's okay, but dashboards like this that you see you know, here, uh, where is it, here behind me um, and, and over here, these sorts of dashboards creating performance over time graphs and, and giving yourself insights into how your organization's operating. I see it in our sales team. Our sales team are all over graphs. They look at them every day. Um, but from a quality, safety, uh, and maybe environmental performance perspective, even here at Best Practice, we're guilty of maybe not looking at it as closely as we should and getting the insights that we want. So we're not perfect. Um, we're, we're improving every day um, as a growing organization and, and a great bunch of motivated individuals are all working very hard to improve our company. My question to you is what are you guys doing? What, how do you get your insights? How do you get your clear picture of your organization's performance? And, and you know, showing you an example like this starts to give you some rationale, but you know, it's about measuring and, and even engaging with your stakeholders and saying to your stakeholders, you know, whether it's your regulators, your customers, your staff, your suppliers, your financial institutions, uh, your leadership team, your board, what are the pieces of data that they like to see, that they want to see, that will enable them to get insights into how your organization is performing. And that clear picture is fundamentally critical. It's been the biggest weakness across uh, all of the organizations we've assessed. If I said it was the most important issue, I think it is, is good quality data and then gaining good quality insights from those data that enable you to use one of the quality principles, which is fact-based decision making and getting those insights will drive your management review and good quality business planning processes into the future. Most importantly, maybe some decisions to stop doing things that aren't working. And that's where organizations get really, really complicated. There's lots of people in lots of organizations doing things that aren't working and no one's measuring the data and holding people accountable for let's do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. So the outcome of this analysis is really let's stop doing what what doesn't work. So um, yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, ultimately just summarizing as we draw to uh, uh, almost the close of our webinar today. Um, how are we going for time, Jack? We're um, a couple of minutes to go. Perfect. Um, is we've got um, the, the cycle of business improvement or the, that's embedded in both ISO 14001 and 9001 is plan, do, check, act. And as we talk about transitioning, and we're transitioning the standard and the evidence that we're looking for. We're looking for evidence and you know what you need to do. And I know I'm being generic, I haven't got any specific examples. So now's the time to start assembling your questions and we'll answer your questions um, as we go through this, uh, the end of this webinar. So please start thinking about what questions you've got. You know, if you want questions about practical tips and tricks, the things that you could do to demonstrate and, and be part of this transition, uh, now's the time to send those either on the public forum, so comment below if you're watching on YouTube, or send us a Facebook message across the Facebook Messenger. But we're talking about plan, do, check, act. So evidence and artifacts to demonstrate that you're planning and you're prioritizing. Em evidence and artifacts to demonstrate that or policies and procedures that you give your people and your organization guidance and, and constraints and limits and those sorts of things uh, to manage and go forward with the organization. Do the things that you said you would do. So what are you saying you're gonna do? What is, what is the process? Uh, if you watch one of our Talking Business episodes on our YouTube channel where we interviewed a gentleman by the name of Andrew Barrett, he talked about business as imagined. It's important that if we're going to document, do we document business as is or we document business as imagined? If we're documenting business as imagined, it's important to execute. You know, it's, it's difficult, sorry, to execute. So be very careful that you're not documenting business as imagined, that you're capturing business as we want it to run and we're prepared and committed to actually running it in that way and doing those things. Then when we get to this checking stage that's that's down the bottom here, we talk about um, 
checking are we doing what we said we would do. And I'll talk more shortly about internal audits and how we can we can look at that. And then and then on the final stage there of our improvement cycle acting. So plan do check act is the quality improvement cycle that was created by Edward Stemming. It's part of the ISO management systems. It's a great model. The plan do check act and ensuring that you've got evidence to demonstrate that you've got that cycle in place. Now if you've got a little cycle of improvement in place, you're most probably meeting the intent the intent of the standard. You might not have all the evidence, but you're certainly meeting the intent of what the standard is, which is go through this cycle lots and lots and lots, many, many times, and you will have no choice but to keep improving every day. Thanks, Jack. What have we got next? Okay. Um, now, obviously, our organisation has a ton of assessors. Uh, that's what we do here at Best Practices. We assess against the standards, and we use that as one of the really fun ways to give you guys guidance and, and advice on the standard, the intent of the standards, and, and you can figure out how you're going to go forward. So the standards re do require internal, internal audits to be conducted, and it's one of the more formal ways of checking that you're doing what you said you'd do. And I'll, and I'll go that, I'll go through these points in a second, but one of the things I've learned over the years with internal audits is there's an incredible amount of insights that come from having your team participate in this program. And when I say participate, get them to do the audits. Now what we call them here at Best Practice is Best Practice Assessments. So if you were to encourage your team to do a Best Practice Assessment internally of each other, have a think about the benefits of that. Now I have seen incredible insights, an incredible amount of learning and knowledge transfer and knowledge retention and absorption and digestion and improvement come from having the internal audit program part of everybody's responsibility. Go and speak with your peers and your colleagues in the organisation and work together to identify opportunities for improvement. Are you doing what you said you would do? Could you please show me? Are there any opportunities for improvement? And having peer-to-peer -peer relationships in the organisation builds culture, builds stronger bonds, identifies real-time realistic opportunities for improvement and gets people motivated to, uh, to support the organisation. So, you know, obviously the bullet points here on this slide, we talk about staff involvement. I've pitched you on that and you know I understand my opinion. Uh, different experiences create best improvement strategies. That's what we were just talking about. We accomplish business objectives. We monitor and evaluate processes and procedures. And we obviously create a roadmap for improvement. So start thinking about how you can involve people. Now we can support you with that internal audit program, with our uh, internal auditing, with our online training. We've got a great online training program uh, this is a veiled sales pitch, but there are some of you out there who get internal audits or training included free when you work with best practice. So um, if you're not currently being assessed by best practice and you're thinking about it, um, something that we include for our customers is free internal auditor training. Um, if you just want some training, you can go across to our training academy and we've got a great online course that's self-paced. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the shop. Um, it's a great course. We, we talk in depth about how to make audits really simple, some really great simple tips and tricks, um, and a few things to practice there. So there's some reading material, lots of videos to watch. And when you, put, you create your own username and password and purchase the course, and then it's yours to keep. You can go back to it at any time. So it's not like a course in a classroom where you do it on Monday and Tuesday, and then after Tuesday it's gone. Um, you've only got the knowledge and your memories. Um, our internal auditor course is, is yours, it's something you purchase and it's there forever. So start having a think about that, um, have a look at that course and more importantly it's designed to be shared in your organisation. So having you know numbers of people buy that course in your organisation to do that training online and then be participating. So we've seen it as a, um, we're very passionate about it supporting organisations and, and getting four or five people to do that course, um, either purchase the course or it's included with a subscription. Um, here at Best Practice, so it's definitely something that can support you. So it's part of that checking exercise and they start thinking about what they can do to improve and then they start thinking about how they're going to execute on that and holding, then you can hold them accountable for helping to implement the changes and helping to improve the organisation. That's probably one of the biggest frustrations of a senior leadership person in any organisation is having your team bring you solutions and then go, you say, yes, that's a great solution. Now go away and execute on that, improve it. And so empowering people and holding people, empowering people to go and execute the improvements themselves and then holding them accountable to that. So um, it certainly worked here at Best Practice. Bring me, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And then I'm going to approve for you to go away and do everything that needs to be done to execute on that. So, you know, as a starting point, 
uh, getting people thinking about business improvement, internal audits or internal best practice assessments, a great way to do that. Okay, Jack, what do we got? So one of the final stages um, that we wanna see um, improved as part of your transition process is your management reviews. It's just not acceptable to do a management review on an annual basis, it's just not realistic. If you're doing your management reviews on an annual basis, you're just doing it because the standard says so. If you wanna get the real benefit of a management review, I would recommend, strongly recommend, quarterly. So how often are you doing your management reviews? Do you sit in those management reviews or participate or read those management reviews and just think this is just a waste of time? If that's the case, it's because they're not frequent enough and we're not looking clearly at the intent of the standard and more importantly, how or what could we do to make them more simple? How could we, what could we delete from the management review process? What could we remove from the management, re, management review process so it's more exciting, it's more fun, and it's more supportive of the growth and improvement of your organization? So, so as you transition uh, more often, management reviews more often, quarterly is the benchmark, quarterly is the best practice. Bi-monthly is good, but it starts to become a little bit often. Uh, obviously, six monthly is not enough. If it's annual, I'm going to be critical of you and say it's just a waste of time. If you're going to do your management reviews annually, you might as well sit at your desk and just write notes. So if you really want to improve your organisation, if you're really, really passionate about the growth of your organisation, then support it with a good, simple, fast, efficient quarterly management review process and ultimately tie it into your quarterly strategic planning. That's what we do here at Best Practice. It's all bundled together. We run our management review and our strategic planning with all of our executives in one hit, one day, every quarter. So we do a two day annual conference of the executives here at Best Practice and then one day per quarter to review our performance. So that's a total of five days of the executive's time per year and we have a facilitator help us with that process. So that's our management review. And in our stats and our performance here at Best Practice, we're proving that it works. So if you can show me um, and, and come back to me with some evidence that um, you're doing it differently and you're doing it less often and, it's, and you're growing faster than us, then maybe I'll sit up and listen. But uh, of the thousands of organisations we've looked at, the ones that do their management review annually, it's just, it just, it's just wasted resources and time and effort. So get, it in, get your business engaged, get your business positively inspired to be improving and then start to celebrate your results and then everybody will start to see that actually this is a good thing to do. So, uh, what we've talked about over here on this slide just is some of the things that are involved. Um, previous actions and status, external, internal issues, non-conformances, corrective actions, monetary measurement, audit results, customer satisfaction, um, performance of external providers, adequacy of resources, process performance. That's a guidance note of the things to include in your assessment. But if I said to you, every quarter, let's check in and see how we're going with our business plan. Are we doing what we planned? Have there been any isolated or um, extraordinary situations that haven't helped us to improve? Um, and what can we do to improve that? Because what we start to do after that review is we have outputs. So we have, you know, maybe, a, and, I'll, and, it's, and it's right here, a series of projects or opportunities, changes to our systems. Now this is changing the way we're executing or delivering our business plan and then any resource needs. So obviously we readjust our budget. So an output of a management review, we should be readjusting our budget. And if you say the process where we readjust our budget is when we do our strategy, that's management review. So maybe you're doing two types of management review. Maybe you are doing the strategic planning sessions, plus you're doing this extra annual management review, which you're questioning the relevance of your annual management review. Stop doing the annual management review because you're doing a quarterly strategic assessment and a quarterly budget adjustment anyway. So the true outcome of a real management review is budgets are being adjusted, projects are being reprioritized, and then we're going away to execute. That's the real management review, that's the intent of the standard. If you're doing something else, then maybe stop that and merge the two things together. It's maybe structurally in the wrong spot in the organization. So the people involved in management review should, for example, be CFOs, CEOs, uh, the senior management, you know, depending on the authority level. So it might be a business unit, but it's the, you know, it's the person that manages the budget and, and approves and disapproves expenditure and manages resources and staff and, and infrastructure, and those sorts of things. Those people need to be involved so they can be part of this improvement cycle. So if people with financial delegations are left out of management review, then we need to be reconsidering its effectiveness and are we meeting the true intent of the standard. 
Okay, so uh, thanks Jack, what have we got next? Okay, let's quickly talk about the Training Academy. Um, if you could uh, put me in the microwave and shrink me a little bit there, Jack, thank you. A um, Couple of great courses uh, that are in our Training Academy to support you. One is obviously our internal order to training right, right over there on the other side, um, which is a great course. I, you know, I've already talked about it, so I won't bang on about it. But we've got two courses there to support you uh, with transitioning. So we've got ISO 9001 transitioning and ISO 14001 transitioning, where we go clause by clause through the things we need to do to improve. Um, I personally presented the 9001 transitioning, I think, um, I'm not sure, we'll have to get in and have a look at that. But Janet um, did the 14001 and Janet's one of our great trainers here in the Best Practice Training Academy. So they're great courses, they've got some good reading material to support you, they've got some great videos, um, absolutely fantastic, worth having a look at. But most importantly, that internal auditor course is something that we've trained tens of thousands of people and they love it, there's some great testimonials there. Uh, people having a lot of fun with it. Uh, you can comment and ask questions in the course and we respond. Uh, so it sends us a message and we can respond. So you still have the full support of a whole bunch of technical people. Uh, you're not just doing an online course that's, uh, that's pre-recorded. You've got videos to watch, you've got notes to read, and you can post comments and ask questions and we'll respond. So you get our full support um, on a, on a real-time basis. So um, it might take us a little while to respond to the questions because we get lots, but uh, we're there to support you. So we'll definitely respond within 24 hours. So great little online course, worth it. It's an investment. It's something that you get to keep and go back to. Uh, and I would, in, uh, I would highly recommend that you do that. So, um, so if you've got questions, now's the time to start sending in and posting your questions. And we have got a couple of questions, so I'm gonna answer those. Um, there's a couple that were emailed in early before the webinar, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna cover those. Um, but if you've got any more questions, uh, start messaging in and we'll start responding. So the first question is, um, why do I have to transition? Um, and I did talk about that. Um, you don't have to transition. Uh, you only have to transition if you want to retain your certification. So if you've got uh, a reason for being certified, um, then whether it's an internal corporate objective or whether it's an external customer or contractual requirement, um, you do have to transition because we can't issue certificates after March next year to old versions of the standard. So uh, why do you have to transition? It's a new version of the standard, it's 2015. Um, and it's and and the previous versions of the standard will be supersede. You know, they're already superseded, uh, but we won't be able to certify against them. So, if you're using an old version of the standard, that's fine. They're great. I talked about that. If you want to retain certification, then it's important that you apply to be transitioned, and you have that process undertaken before March 2018. And if you go past September 2018, your certificates will expire. So. Uh, and that's okay. Um, you know, I have seen organisations that, you know, they've got a certificate, it's an old certificate, it's expired. But provided you're still implementing your management system, you can still say to your customers, we implement a management system in accordance with the standard, um, but we just choose to not maintain certification. And that's okay. You, you've got my full support, and I will help you to argue that point. So if you are choosing to not be certified, that's okay. And if you want my support in terms of what you would tell a customer, you say, look, we're not gonna maintain certification, we are maintaining our management system. Certification is just about the independent review and evaluation and, um, and sign off uh, that, that we certify you. So an external person's come in, senior management system is being implemented and we put our hand on our heart and, and, and say that you're approved. So, um, Okay, so let me just read out a couple of these questions. Um, do I have to do internal audits? Yes, uh, there's a provision in the standard that says you have to do internal audits. Um, I'd highly recommend training your internal auditors um, and, and you know, we, we obviously talked about that in the course, um, so I'd, uh, I'd encourage you to take up that offer to do that course. Uh, next question is, what would be the top three things to focus on? Um, okay, the top three things to focus on if you transitioning is do the risk register, do the SWOT analysis. If you, if you haven't done a SWOT analysis before and it's not part of your management system, do a SWOT analysis, do a risk register, and then focus on your evidence of your management reviews, so your quarterly management reviews. So I think they would be my top tips. Um, while it's not a new requirement, but it's a requirement that's been enhanced in the standard is your dashboard of statistics. So if there were four things, SWOT analysis, risk register, management review and your or your dashboard on your management review four things if you could focus on those things and refreshing those documents to prepare yourself for an auditor i think you're going to get a long way through the audit um, 
you know, in terms of the new things that you would do to transition. Now, I would also ask you one more question around that is, what can you remove from your management system? Now, I don't know obviously what's in your management system, but I would encourage you to take this opportunity with transitioning to delete bureaucracy, remove things that are just not necessary. They might have been a good idea, uh, but people get nervous about deleting stuff. Um, but really start thinking, go back to first principles. You know, you, you can basically run a management system that's really simple, but what can we delete? What can we remove? Please, please don't have too many policies and procedures and things documented because you've got to maintain them and they, they're a waste of time, no one reads them. So please take this opportunity to look at, well, what can we delete? Now, if you need to put that in your risk register, um, then go right ahead and you say, you know, we deleted this policy, this manual. You don't, you don't need a quality manual anymore. Uh, you can have an intranet, website, you can have videos, you can use all the different file formats, multimedia formats um, as part of your management system now. It doesn't have to be like lots of words on paper. Um, an induction might just be a video. You know, an induction might have been an induction manual in the past where people read it, but now it's a video. So, you know, using these smartphones to rec record videos and then save those videos to a um, to a private Facebook group, that's a management system. I've seen organisations use private Facebook groups to run their internal staff training. And you can see the members of the group that have seen the post, that's your training record, that's your training evidence. In fact, that's what we do here at Best Practice. So think creatively about how you can improve and reduce the effort uh, with implementing your management system because it's really effect, it's really, what we wanna be doing is focusing on our business plan and efficiently executing and implementing our business plan into the future so our organization can be simple, profitable, fun, sustainable, and safe into the future. Okay, Beck and June, any more questions? Why does everyone go quiet? Okay, um, all right, what we're gonna do is, we haven't got any more questions, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna monitor the Facebook page now and I will respond to those questions. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll text back to you. So if you've got more questions, oh, there's a couple more coming in. All right, we'll, we'll I think, are we out of time? We're out of time. So uh, what I'm gonna do is monitor the Facebook page now for you, and we'll go back and, um, and we will answer those questions for you. So send, either send me a private personal LinkedIn message, find me at Kobe Simmet on LinkedIn. Uh, you can tweet me if you like. Um, you can take all those opportunities, but uh, you can, if you're watching in our training academy, there's a little, watch on YouTube button down the bottom there. You can watch on YouTube and you can post comments. Uh, or more importantly, go to the Best Practice Certification Facebook page uh, or directly to our website. I didn't talk about that. If you go to bestpracticecertification.com.au, our website, then we have a live chat facility and Rowan's sitting there. He's able to answer that. You know, he can grab your question and we can get an answer to it. So a whole bunch of technical people here in the office all the time. So it doesn't have to be right now if you've got a question, but if you need our support, Please send in the questions. We're always happen, happy to answer little simple questions for free. Um, it's part of what our, you know, delivering on our passion. And if we can just unlock a little blockage for you and get you improving every day, then that will be fantastic. That's what we're here for. So take the opportunity to have a browse around our Training Academy shop. There's a bunch of great courses there. The courses aren't just necessarily targeted at you. We've got a great induction course where I present about management systems and you can use me to tell your staff, your new staff when they start at your company, what having a management system is all about, what best practice is all about. So have a look at our induction course, a whole bunch of great courses there in the Training Academy that I'd encourage you all to take up those opportunities. Uh, we'll see if we can dig out a little discount for you guys that have watched this webinar and we'll email that out to you. So that'll be a special discount that's just for you guys. Um, but have a look at the shop, um, we'll see what we can find and um, put into a little bundle for you. And, um, and we'll get that going. But um, thank you for your support. It's the sales that we make in our training academy that pay for these great webinars. Uh, equally, there's a couple of great things happening. Issue two of Certified, our new magazine, has just dropped. Now you can get a copy of issue two of Certified from our training academy, it's $5, it's absolutely fantastic. If you're an existing client of best practice, we'll be mailing you a copy, it's included with your subscription. Um, but if you wanna get a copy of issue two of Certified, great magazine, shout out to the marketing team. Uh, for putting together a great educational magazine that's new here at Best Practice. So it's, you can read it online through the Training Academy. It's $5, great little thing that you can buy. Um, equally, if you want to engage with us here at Best Practice and you feel that your company might benefit from our audience and you've got things, we're looking for sponsors to support and advertise in our magazine. So if you want to reach out to our customers, our clients, 
contact me personally on LinkedIn or message marketing at bestpracticecertification.com.au and Lauren and Beck will have a look at what we've got and we might be able to collaborate and work together. If you know somebody fantastic who you think would feature well in our talking business, I'm always looking for inspiring stories for our talking business episodes. So jump across onto the Best Practice YouTube channel, have a look at the playlists, and there's a playlist there with talking business, and they're the great inspiring people that I'm interviewing and talking with, and they've got tips and tricks. It's all free advice for you right here at Best Practice, and it's something that we love doing. So grab a training course on your way out of the store this afternoon, absolutely fantastic. Good luck with your learning journey. Uh, if you want us to help you with certification and on-site audits and you want one of our great assessors to come visit you, then uh, please reach out to our sales team and they can help form up a commercial package for you to, uh, to help with your certification and we can come and help you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, thanks for joining us here at the Best Practice Training Academy. It's been, again, fun. Um, in Certified, we've got the four dates for our upcoming webinars. So grab yourself a copy of Certified. It's got the schedule of dates for all of these webinars coming up. Uh, over the next, um, what have we got, four months. So uh, that'll come out in issue two. So yes, I saw those the draft dates of that this morning. So, um, so if you get yourself a copy of Certified, it's got the TV program for the monthly webinars here at Best Practice. So look out for those great content coming your way. It's absolutely fantastic. So hit subscribe on the YouTube channel and you'll see us all next time on Best Practice TV. I'm Kobe Simmett. Thanks for joining us. It's been great today. No technical issues today, Jack, which has been absolutely fantastic. I'll get to those questions that are coming through. I've got lots of text messages now from everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you soon. Stay safe. Bye for now.